I've played tons of PC games and in my lifetime there's no guarantee that I'll ever be able to come across all of them. It's a constant journey in playing these titles and hoping I get the experience that the developer intended for me. Most of the time I do. Many PC games are great but sometimes there are games that are just bad. Games that are so bad that they end up on a list of games that you should avoid. Games that are so bad that I'd rather jizz concrete than ever take the time to play them again. And that's the purpose of today's episode, 10 more PC games that you should avoid. Now understand, these aren't the worst games on the home computer, they're just games that make you want to gargle broken glass, right? Let's begin. A flawed masterpiece. That's what I build Daggerfall as. Elder Scrolls Arena was a novel concept in terms of how gamers could walk around a bustling town with NPCs that would help you. The map system and fast travel was epic, but one thing that I felt was missing was proper dungeons. Back in the early days of RPGs, many dungeons were isolated to square-based maps that had two to three floors, and as time went on, those floors would increase to the ultimate showdown, right? Even Arena was like that. But Daggerfall took a unique perspective to it focusing on a very intricate and confusing dungeon style that felt way too big. Sue me. Basically, we play as the player of our creation going to the Iliac Bay and doing some chores for the Emperor. We need to find out why King Lysandus' ghost is wrangling people's dingles at 3 a.m. and also, oh, by the way, killing them. And we also need to find a letter that was written by the Emperor for the Queen of Daggerfall. Seems easy, right? No. No, it isn't. These quests that you're provided are so broken that you're lucky if you even notice that you're on the next quest, of which can be incredibly easy to fail. That's assuming that the coding doesn't shoot you in the foot and create a fail state. I appreciate Daggerfall so much for what it did, but it is a flawed masterpiece. Between me and you, if you want to play Daggerfall, please consider playing the Unity version. It fixes everything. Just trust me. This is a very modern game, it only came out in 2019, and it's one of my mods, Divine Shadow's favorite games. In fact, the only reason I played it was because he made me do it via an override. Not once, but twice! And to be honest, I never could get into it. From first glances, it's a top-down survival horror. Cool, it's an open world game, even better. It has a day and night cycle, time goes on, I like that. But then you get into combat, the hallucinogen, cooking phase, making sure your hideout is well equipped to deal with the bullshit, it's not fun to me at all. In fact, it's brutally unfair. The top-down perspective is a really dangerous way of providing a graphical interface to consumers because some people really don't like having to fight things they can't see that are obscured by buildings. Some people really don't like having to contend with lackluster inventory management. And some people really don't like layered menus for interacting with objects, and guess what? I'm all three of those in tandem. This game is not fun to me, but it might be to you. Uh-oh, I can hear the hormonal raging of a thousand suns coming from the 90s. Don't, Don't talk, talk bad about, about the movie lady. Lady, lady. Boops. No, fuck Tomb Raider. People hold it on this pedestal for its innovative graphics, smooth controls, and riveting gameplay, but I see it as a warped, annoying graphics nightmare where I can't tell up from down or a wall from a cliff. Asinine tank controls that worked on literally any game that wasn't a platformer with precision jumps, and gameplay that is so boring because you almost consistently don't know where to go, and you fall just for fun, literally. Most of the game I get so frustrated I just launch Lara off a cliff just to watch her crumble into a pile of bones. That's my cathartic release. The story is great, I'll never knock it. We play as Lara Croft and we're told to find something for Jacqueline Notla. After we find it, we get betrayed. And because Lara is British, she's predestined to find what doesn't belong to her and slam it into her own personal museum. She'll also go to the ends of the world to do so. And for my British viewers that slightly blew air out of their nose because they understand that Britain has operated on the principles of finder's keeper since the dawn of time, this is why we're friends. <laughs> the older Tomb Raider games are very much a trial by fire when it comes to what to do, where to go, and how to defend yourself, and to me the camera is just not efficient. I haven't checked out the remaster that just came out, but if you want to, 
be my guest. I heard they did fix some quality of life issues, so maybe I'll check it out one day. I know we talked about HeroQuest being the first game in the series that would eventually turn into Warhammer Fantasy, but what if we took a look at the first Warhammer 40k game? That's what Space Crusade is. Now fair warning, much like HeroQuest was a board game, Space Crusade was as well, albeit with much simpler rules, and if you've seen my previous episodes, you know that board game to PC game conversions can be incredibly hit or miss. In the case of Games Workshop, early PC adaptation of board games, they follow the instructions to the print and the game flow is just as slow as it would be in person. Now obviously with the PC game, we're able to have a very simple 3D rendering of the board and the encounters that we have, which is kind of cool. The issues that I ran into is that I wasn't patient enough to deal with the rules and the setup alone was very labor intensive and in no way user friendly. Once the game starts, you'll find yourself rolling virtual dice and being confused by the rules unless you are extremely familiar with the tabletop game itself. I did find it interesting, but I didn't find it fun at all. Unfortunately, it would take a while before Warhammer 40k games would become fun. Oh boy, Boot Camp! Now this is a 1987 Konami arcade game which basically emulates you going through the boot camp for the United States Marines. Minus 90% of what makes Marine Boot Camp so fun, right? <laughs> if you know, you know. Now the game itself, I've actually never played it, but it looks dope as hell. We go through all of these obstacle courses, uh, then a firing exercise, and the last stage is a special mission from the president and we only get one chance to do it. Now you might be asking yourself, why are you talking about this if you've never played it? Well, the reason I didn't play it was because the arcade cabinet utilizes two buttons and a trackball. The two arcade formats that I can't mess with right now are ones that have trackballs and ones that have steering wheels. At some point, I do wish to check them out. I just need to get the peripheral, right? So what did I do? Well, I played the DOS version, which looks like this. Oh, banana development, we can always count on you for quality graphics and a soundtrack that sounds like Frank Zappa's left testicle became sentient and started composing music. This game is impossible to tolerate, much less play. So if you ever consider playing Boot Camp for the MS-DOS, uh, maybe don't. I know that the theme of my channel is fire and I call you as a community the firefighters and while some of you might think I'm a firefighter in real life, playing Emergency 3 or Brave Firefighters in the arcades was the closest I've ever been to doing it. Emergency 3 was a badass time so logically I wanted to go back and see where the series started and the answer to that question is 1998 courtesy of 16 Tons Entertainment. The game covers all of the same things it would in the future but it executes it horribly. For those who haven't played Emergency before, we go through scenarios that require an emergency response. For example, we'll respond to a fire, a crash, arresting a perpetrator who is robbing people. It's relatively straightforward, but all games, no matter what franchise they're a part of, have to start somewhere. When we enter a stage, we go to the blockhouse where every comprehensible emergency service is situated, be it police, fire, or ambulance, as well as public works. We have to manually pick a person, send them to the vehicle, and figure out how to dispatch them. Once you figure that out, you have to hope and pray that you got the right assets, because if you don't, things will go horribly wrong. The first mission itself isn't bad, but the second mission involves responding to the potential, the potential, for a crash during a race. And if you don't know where those crashes are going to occur, you're gonna waste 30 minutes to an hour before you lose, it's bad. I will say the series did get better moving forward, but this is one that you can definitely pass on. This game was recommended to me by a Twitch viewer, Salvo Subs, a fellow streamer and game developer. I'll link his information down below. I don't recall what he thought about it, if he liked it or if he didn't like it, but I know that I didn't like it. It's a futuristic racing simulator with some of the worst damage physics and rubber banding I've witnessed in the late 90s in terms of racing games. 
And of course, it's brought to us by Ubisoft, and boy, does it fucking reek of Ubisoft buffoonery. You know, where a planet is being overtaken by fungus and we need to win the races to earn a slot on the last ship off of Io, the moon of Jupiter. Yeah, that's the plot. The one thing that stands out about the game is that we can choose to make our cars run like shit to increase another aspect. For example, if you want to make it handle like dog shit for the sole purpose of going fast, you can, but don't touch anyone else. Oh no, no, no. You touch anyone else, even with a glancing blow and you're dead, period dot. It's like your car is made out of the same shit that the Ocean Gate submarine was made out of. It just crinkles if you even look at it wrong. To be honest, it was really only made to be a benchmark checker. The original versions of this came for free if you had a Pentium or a Pentium 2 MMX or an AMD K6 processor. It also noticeably used the 3DFX chipset with the Glide API. Now to me, there are many other better racing games out there, but if you want to stick with this franchise and see where it goes, it did have a sequel on the Dreamcast, Pod 2. Oh shit, okay, this game infuriated the fuck out of me. It's from the creative LSD mind of Frederick Raynal. You might recognize him as the director of Time Commando or the first Alone in the Dark. The company is Adeline Software and I hate their games tremendously. We play as Twin Sin on the planet of Twin Sun who is imprisoned because he receives a vision that destines him to take down the bad guy. It's literally the plot. So we see that FMV, which of course runs slower than the narration, because why not? And we end up in an isometric nightmare. We can walk around, but how do we run? How do we fight? How do we do anything? Well, we need to choose our stance. If you hit the stance button, you can choose between normal stance, aggressive stance, athletic stance, or discreet stance. Bear in mind, it would take nothing to just, I don't know, change between them based on keystrokes, but no. You gotta manually change them. I can't attack anyone unless I'm in aggressive mode where we bulk up, we growl at people, nor can I sneak around unless I'm in discreet mode. It's, it's just fucking horrible. Don't play this one. There, there's a sequel to it. I've heard it's better, but the first game is Butthole. I love point and click games. I've played tons of them and you know what I love more than point and click games? Free point and click games. When you install GOG, sometimes you get free games. And for me, it was Beneath a Steel Sky and Lure of the Temptress, both made by Revolution Software, a company that would go on to create one of the most successful point and click line of games, the Broken Sword series. Now, why do I hate Lure of the Temptress? because its ambition clouded its execution. In the game, we play as Deermont, a peasant who gets a note that kickstarts our journey. Basically, this race known as the Squirrel, led by an enchantress, takes over the kingdom. It's our job to kill the enchantress and to get clues on how to do so through the village of Turnvale and its NPCs. You might think, that's pretty straightforward. What's the issue? Why are you being a baby? The issue is is that this game has a proprietary system of how you talk to people. There are constantly active conversations going on, meaning that as you navigate the streets, you or your companion, Rat Pouch, will openly engage in conversation with other pedestrians. Imagine this, every single time you walk through Walmart with your kids, saying hi, excuse me, or hey dad, look at that, you are magically immobilized. Got it? Now imagine the same exact thing happening in this game, walking through the tavern and listening, being forced to listen to the secondary conversation, waiting for it to end to be able to hear your conversation is so fucking annoying. This was one of the first revenge games I ever put on the list because it was such a slog to make it through, but I did. And in the end, it was a 30 minute game at best. I played this one a while back because if I recall, it was October and I finally decided to do a month of spooky games. Technically, The Seventh Guest is a horror game if we go off the plot, but to me, it's obviously not scary at all. It's just horrifically frustrating. It was developed by Trilobite, which as a company didn't do dick fuck before closing their doors. 
And I want to say they only released about five games before they were shuttered in 1998. And for whatever reason, they relaunched in 2010, releasing this shitty game yet again for the mobile platforms. The whole game revolves around you being an amnesiac and waking up in some dude's mansion and observing ghosts and solving the mystery. Yay. Now you might be saying, Fort, you love puzzle games. You play them all the time. You like Myst. What gives? Why the hypocrisy? Were you adopted? Do you smoke crack? The answer to those questions is yes. Except for the crack part. Don't do drugs created in two bedroom apartments, kids. I do love puzzle games, and I'll be honest with you, given the attention to detail and the production value of this game, I was stoked to check it out. But this game alone has some of the most infuriating, asinine, skull fucking puzzles I've ever had the misfortune of attempting to complete. Many of them involve chess, and guess what? The chess pieces don't move like they're supposed to, so I was already kind of cranky going into it. In the end, I needed a walkthrough to get through some of the puzzles, many of which are bastardizations of other forms of puzzles. There are so many better puzzle games out there, and this one isn't it. Trust me. And I have a sequel to look forward to as well, The Eleventh Hour. Woohoo. And that's it for today's list. What did you think of it? Are there any PC games that you really can't stand? Feel free to tell everyone down below in the comments section. Who knows, maybe you'll share a combined experience with someone. If you made it to the end of this episode, you're already home in our community. We're a group of individuals who love remembering a time when life was just a little bit easier to live. And if that's a vibe you enjoy, then feel free to join us on our journey to 8,000 subscribers. If we reach that milestone, I'll do a special video of the community's choosing. Finally, the single most important thing you could do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly affects the visibility of the videos and the projects that I work on every single day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, Fortifier out.